everybody to church tonight. We're singing Higher Ground. Let's stand as we sing together, please. tonight with prayer. Brother James, would you lead us, please? Thank you. You may be seated. It's wonderful just to be able to get every single week, uh, halfway through the week, and just to gather with our brothers and sisters, just fellowship and learn more about the Lord from His Word and from His man, which I'm very excited about in just a couple of minutes, and I'm sure all of you will enjoy it uh, immensely as well as how we get to have a dear friend of ours uh, come and preach for us for this evening. But a couple things we just want to get to in really quickly in way of announcements is, first of all, continue to pray for Pastor and his family as they had the burial for Miss Margaret Moore uh, yesterday. Uh, wonderful service from everything that we have heard. Everything went very, went very well for it. And continue to pray for them as the rest of this week they're going to be uh, taking time to divvy up the rest of her estate and see how she wanted things to be handled. So please be in prayer that all of that will go smoothly for them. And also be in prayer as they will be traveling back to us later this week as well, that God will just keep a hedge of protection around them and uh, this uh, big convoy of vehicles that they're going to be having coming on home uh, to North Carolina. But please uh, continue to be in prayer for them as uh, they're going to be traveling and uh, still dealing with the uh, uh, with the mourning that they are going to be going through for a little while now. So please continue to be in prayer for them if you can. All right, we're very excited, of course, that in the month of August, we have done it every year. Our Revive Conference is right around the corner. Pastors still waiting to hear back from one of our preachers that if they will be able to make it or not. So as soon as we get confirmation from him, uh, we will uh, get you the names of our preachers. But the lineup's already looking stacked, as, uh, as, as you can uh, you say you say that in uh, the sports world. So we're very excited for it. And you don't want to miss a single night where every single Sunday night of 
of, of the month of August, we'll have a new preacher joining us uh, to just challenge us in a great way from the Word of God. So please uh, be spreading word about that and be inviting people, and it'll be a wonderful time for us all through the month of August. Junior camp is still on, uh, still on schedule for July 31st all the way through August 5th out at the Wilds, parents. We will be giving more information about that very, very soon. So please uh, keep your ears open for it, and we are going to get everything moving. And it's going to be a great time for the kids, and I'm excited for them just to be able to go have a great week of not just fun, but also solid Bible preaching and just disconnecting from everything that they've got that's going on in the world right now. So please be in prayer for that and be in prayer for our young people as God just prepares their hearts for what he has for them uh, during their week of camp. We are very excited, of course, to have a day of baby dedication on August 6th. But as Pastor stated, sometimes the baby dedication is more for the parents than it is for the actual baby as the parents got to learn to let go and let God, really, with the baby, with their baby's life. So please, be in prayer for that service, as it's going to be a great time, and it's going to be a wonderful time just to be able to dedicate those uh, those young, young babies to whatever the Lord has for them for the rest of their lives. And uh, it's not always easy for parents to do that, but please, be in prayer for it, and it's going to be a wonderful service uh, for all of us to be together. And then the following Sunday, immediately, we will be having our uh, membership Sunday, where we will have a couple of people taking new membership here at the church. Praise the Lord for that. And we continue to invite people as well to the church. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful time just to be able to get uh, more people to add to the Wildwood family. And as we've shared in a statistic before, when people always say, how did you start coming to church? Less than 5% of people said, well, the pastor invited me. But over 70% of people said, it's because a friend of mine invited me to come to church one time. So when we say that it's the building of the church, it is for everybody to take part in, not just those who work for the church or those who are in the leadership roles. It is for everybody to have a small hand in just inviting even a single person. You know what's interesting to me is if we all invite one person, they start attending faithfully. They could invite two people. They start attending faithfully, and it just starts spreading more and more and more. So please, uh, be uh, inviting people to come to church on a regular basis, not just for our special Sundays, but also for uh, our weekly gatherings as well. And uh, we do enjoy what the Lord has done for us and how he has blessed us so richly the past, uh, the past several uh, months and years, and we know that he'll continue to do so on into the future. But that is what we have right now in the way of announcements. We're going to move into our time of tithes and offerings with our ushers already in place. Just a time for us to give back to the Lord without he has so blessed us uh, each uh, individually. Uh, we won't worry about sections for tonight. Uh, we'll just have, if you have an offering, please just go ahead and uh, uh, bring it on out to us. All right. I'm going to ask Brother Ken Driver, if he will please uh, ask for the Lord's blessing on this offering. Brother Bobby, you need your hymnal for this next song. We're singing a song about heaven. So if you would take your hymnal, and we're at number 656. Number 656. Let's sing the first, second, and last stanzas. Let's stand as we sing together, please. I'm just a pastor. 
Phil for leading us in our time of worship. We're going to go to our uh, prayer time now, so if you have your prayer sheet with you, you can pull that on out really quickly. I have not, uh, for this week, received any updates about anything from our prayer sheet. Do we have any cur- updates from anybody to give right now so Ms. World can update our list for this week? Have we heard anything? Ms. Shelby, how are you doing in your recovery right now? Oh, well, wonderful. Amen. 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 And you're just going to let Brother Dalton continue with the cooking for a little while, right? You know, when you start to feel a little bit better, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I can do it quite yet, dear. <laughs> Amen. Well, that's wonderful. Praise the Lord for his continued mercy and uh, protection on our lives each and every day. Anyone else? There's a praise item, of course, that the uh, National Association, which is actually the National Convention, is finishing up tonight with a final service. Everything has gone very well so far at the convention. I was there earlier today. It was great just to fellowship with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and to hear about a few things that are going on. Uh, with our with our uh, national convention and with some of the other sister churches that we have all all, all across America, so uh, be uh, in prayer for their final. Ser- we'll be in prayer for their final service tonight. Everything that goes smoothly and that hearts will be touched and moved in a great way for this evening. Anyone else? All right. No, I, I was about to move into a time of prayer request.
What was his name again? Gary Burdett. All right. Be in prayer for uh, Brother Burdett battling leukemia right now. Anyone? Any other requests for this evening? Yes. Eric Thor. Thorpe. Okay. Do you know how long his uh, recovery is going to be? Mm -hmm. All right. We'll definitely be in prayer for Mr. Eric Thorpe recovering from neck surgery right now. Yes, Ms. Jenkins. And you said it was brain cancer? All right. Pray for Miss Whitfield. Yes, Miss Whitfield. Yes, ma'am. That was Bobby Overman. All right. All right. Anyone else? All right. If nothing, if nothing else for this evening, we'll move into a time of prayer. Ask for the Lord to uh, be with all the requests that were mentioned. Uh, how many of you have an unspoken for this evening? Show of hands. Absolutely. The Lord knows every one of those needs, and He'll work out the the uh, the outcome however way He sees fit, and His will will be accomplished in a great way. All right. All right, if that's all that we have, we'll move into a time of prayer. Ask for God to be with these uh, requests for this evening, and we'll move into our time of preaching for this evening. Brother Bobby, will you please ask for the Lord's blessing on these uh, requests for this evening?
Isn't it great to know that we serve a God that is eager to hear our prayers and he promises that he will answer them in some way. So it's great just to always bring our cares and concerns to God, knowing that he is listening and listening eagerly to each and every one of our prayers for this evening. Uh, of course, as always, if uh, there is any updates that you would like to give for the prayer sheet or uh, anything like that that you don't see on it, please see Miss Whirl. She does her best to keep, up, keep it updated every week, but I just wanted to remind everyone of that as well. Uh, if you need anything, please see Miss Whirl for the prayer list, and she will update it as, uh, uh, as soon as possible. It is my honor and privilege, actually, to introduce our speaker for this evening. I got a chance to meet Brother Justin about, well, I don't know, about three years ago, three and a half years ago, something like that. Uh, Brother Justin was serving out at Mount Calvary at the time with, uh, Brother, uh, uh, <clears throat> with Brother Frank. And uh, I remember that when I first met Brother Justin, he's just one of those guys, like I said about Brother Raju a couple weeks ago, you can't help but love this guy when you, when you meet him the first time around, all right? And uh, he's one of these people that when you meet him, he makes you feel like you've been friends for decades all through your life, even though you've just met the man about 30 seconds ago, all right? But uh, it is great to have Brother Justin. He's done a, we've done a few joint activities uh, together out here at the church, had a wonderful time with it. He now serves out in Greenville uh, at Belvoir Free Will Baptist with Brother Henry, uh, Henry Parker. And I had the chance to actually, in college, in my sophomore year, to attend out at Belvoir for church. And I got to know Brother Henry out there. And when I heard Justin was going to be going out there to serve with him, I thought to myself, that is a great pair right there them two getting together, but I knew that when they would get together, there would be shenanigans probably going on around the church a fair bit, but it's great to be able to have you, Brother Justin. Don't take that, any, don't t don't take that the wrong way or anything. It's all meant in love, but uh, hey, it's great to have you with us today, Justin. How about you come on up here today and share what the Lord has, to, has laid on your heart for us for this evening. Let's give him a Wildwood welcome, please. <laughs> I tell you what. With an introduction like that, I wish my wife felt that good about me. I tell you what, that's awesome. Thank you, brother. Uh, first of all, I just want to tell y'all thank you so much. You may not have had a choice in it, but thank you so much for allowing me to come to preach tonight. Uh, I thank the world of your pastor. I uh, love him. I thought he was a good judge of character until uh, he allowed me to come speak here, but uh, I do appreciate him. And I see Hannah now snuck up into service, so good to see her. I uh, was able to become friends with her, uh, my wife and I, before we met Caleb. So, uh, you know, before we even met Caleb, I was like, he must be all right. You know, if Hannah likes him, we can like him too. So uh, I hope you all appreciate what you have here at Wildwood. A great pastor, pastor's wife, uh, youth pastor and youth pastor's wife. You all are very, very blessed. I was able to bring the youth group out here a while back, uh, not too long ago, when C.T. Townsend was here. You all remember that? Were you all able to be here? Uh, all right, that was awesome. I uh, really enjoyed that. He sang one of my favorite songs. And what a dynamic uh, preacher he is. Uh, really thankful for what the Lord uh, did in that service and uh, thankful for what the Lord's going to do tonight. So go ahead and get your Bibles out. Turn to the book of Nahum. Turn to the book of Nahum. We're going to be in the first chapter. I heard my buddy Bradley Dixon was here on Sunday night and uh, he got you out of here on time. So I've got to go to get you out of here uh, in a decent hour. Of course, I've got kids, so i got to get home to put them to bed, too. My wife is filling in for me at junior church, or she would have been here. Um, but y'all pray for her, too. She was a little nervous. You know, those junior kids, they can be intimidating, uh, you know, if you've ever worked with them. Amen, brother? Right on. Well, we're going to hit a couple of verses, uh, but we're going to look in verse 7 to begin with. You have Nahum chapter 1, verse 7. It says, The Lord is good. Can I get an amen? amen? A stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. I want to talk to you about a good among destruction. Good among destruction. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we praise you. Thank you again for the opportunity to preach your word uh, tonight, Lord. Uh, we're so thankful we can be energized uh, throughout the week, Lord, because we know the world throws everything it can at us, Lord, and can be burdensome during the week. But we're thankful we can come into your house to be around other Christians, Lord, uh, to worship you together, Lord. So help us to do that today, uh, not, not just in song, Lord, but in your word. And we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So just to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, uh, my wife is named Heather. I guess I'm going to tell you a little bit about her, too. And um, I have two kids, an 8-year-old and an 11-year-old, a little boy and a little girl. The boy was easy, so I thought I was a professional parent until I had the girl. 
And then it blew my mind. I'll tell you what, that is, uh, maybe one of you who has raised a girl can write a book and let me read it real quick because uh, it is a challenge. But I've been in uh, ministry for around 20 years now. Um, been at Belvoir for about a year and three months, I believe. And it's the first time in my life I've been able to be full time in the ministry. And uh, I was always bivocational before and everything. And I'll tell you what, I absolutely love it, love it. One thing uh, in youth ministry, um, uh, of course, I've learned several things, and I'm continuing to learn how little I do know. Uh, but one thing that can really mess up a youth group is when they start dating each other. You know, that, that's when things get a little squirrely. You know what I'm saying? Now, I, I will tell you, it, you can, you know, I'm not going to say it's a sin or anything by far. My parents met. Uh, my mom was 13. My dad was 18. Uh, he was robbing the cradle a little bit there, I guess. But, hey, it worked. It worked. And they were married forever. Uh, so, uh, you know, it can work. But I tell you what, sometimes uh, dating in high school can really mess you up. And I know that from experience, okay? I, I, want, I want people to learn from my mistakes, so I like to share my own experiences and stuff. I dated one girl in high school for two and a half years. And then I dated another girl for two years uh, neither one of them ended up being my wife. So you're talking about a lot of wasted time. You know, I hate to say it that way just in case one of them's watching or whatever, but a lot of wasted time. Uh, I remember this one girl I was dating, and I thought we were close. I thought we were tight and everything, you know. Uh, and I remember we went out to eat with a bunch of friends, and we were sitting there, and usually she was a uh, you know, chatterbox, and she was being a little bit quiet. So I was like, no problem or anything. It was really cool. I had one of my good friends right across the table, and I was like, man, he's being quiet too. Man, why is no, everybody being quiet around the table? Is it just me? You know, do I smell bad? Is, it, is there something on my face besides my face that they're having to look at? I don't know. What's going on? So on the way home, I'm driving, and she's really quiet. I'm like, what in the world? I'm like, what's going on? Man, you were quiet. My buddy was quiet. What were y'all doing, playing footsies under the table? <laughs> she didn't laugh. She started crying. She's like, I don't know how you knew, but I'm so sorry. I'm like, what? What? My girlfriend and my, <laughs> we were friends, were playing footsies under the table, and I'm right beside her. I'm like, you've got to be kidding you're not going to believe this, we didn't last <laughs> after that. But I remember when we broke up, I'm like, maybe we were supposed to be together. And, 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 but then she started dating somebody else. I'm like, I'm really, Ronnie, I'm really going to have to bring on the charm to bring her back. Okay? So what did I do? I baked cookies. I brought them to her house, knocking on the door. Her mom answered the door, and her mom's like, oh, hello, Justin. You know? I'm like, hello, Miss so-and-so. <laughs> I don't want to slip up and say any names because uh, actually the, 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 my, my buddy ended up being a pastor and you would know him, but that's not important. You're, don't come to me after the service. I'm not going to tell you. It's not Pastor Henry or Pastor Jonathan, I promise you. All right, so <laughs> that would have been weird though. All right, so I go in the house. I got this plate of cookies and I'm about to walk back to my ex and I'm like, this is going to win her some homemade chocolate cookies. And she turns around the mother and goes, um, I just want to let you know she's back there with her new boyfriend. This is odd. And I'm like holding this plate of cookies, and I'm like, oh, here you go. And I hand it to her, and I'm walking out, and she, and she touched me. She goes, Justin, Justin, this too will pass. <laughs> I turn around, I'm like, what is she talking about? I, and to this day, I'm like, but guess what? In her words of wisdom, it did. See, at the time, it was devastating. My little heart was crushed. And that's one of the bad things about dating high school. You get those hearts crushed and, you know, all this, you know, ah, and it's terrible and everything. My heart was crushed. At the time, I was like, this is the worst thing ever. But guess what? Let's fast forward a little bit. I am married to the prettiest, take no offense to this, redhead in the world. I better say, any hair color in the world. i got to be careful how I say that. The prettiest woman in the world. I am. I love her. She's absolutely wonderful. At the time, I thought I was absolutely 
devastated. And I was devastated. Uh, I became close to somebody at a young age when I shouldn't have. But now God, I am married to God's gift to me. She's the perfect woman for me. We're serving the Lord together. Been married for 18 years and still going. But I want you to think about this. Have you ever had a time in your life where you were absolutely devastated, but later on it ended up being a good thing? You know what I'm saying? We're about to read about something in the book of Nahum, how it is something that seems absolutely devastating, and it is, but we're going to see how it can turn around uh, for the good. Now, not a lot of people preach from this book. I love the Old Testament. The Bible says, and lo, I'm found in the volume of the book. And that's speaking about Jesus Christ. One thing that changed my devotional life is when I started looking for Jesus all the way from Genesis to Revelation and not just in the New Testament. And that changed my life. So the New Testament is awesome. Guess what? The Old Testament is awesome as well. And it's critical that we study both of them so that we can put them together because they, they blend so nicely. But in the book of Nahum, it, it is, is brutality, it's judgment, it's wrath. And in other words, Joel Olstein's probably not going to be preaching from this book and everything. So it's tough. It's a tough book, but it's good for us. So follow along with me in verse 1. That's where we're going to start at. It says, The burden or the prophecy of Nineveh or against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. God is is jealous. Now let's stop right there. A lot of atheists will come to you and say, what kind of God do you serve? He's a jealous God. In fact, Oprah Winfrey, she used to be, I believe it was in a Baptist church, and she was sitting in church one day when her, her pastor preached from the Bible and saying, God is a jealous God. And she goes, I can't serve a jealous God. And she left that, and now she's part of the New Age. I don't want to offend any of the ladies if Oprah's still on or anything, but she's part of the New Age. She's part of the cult, I'll tell you that. All right? But what she did not understand when it comes to God's jealousy, and it's an entire sermon, is uh, not jealous of. Okay? I'm not jealous of my wife. I'm not but I'm jealous for my wife. In other words, if somebody comes to mess with my wife, guess what? You're going to mess with me, which ain't much, but I'll do the best I can. God is not jealous of. God is jealous for you because he loves you. That's what she didn't get. So yeah, our God's a jealous God, but in a righteous way. God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth, again, or avenges, and is furious. Now I'll tell you what, when you're reading the Bible and you hear that the Lord is furious about something, you better take note. It says, the Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Aren't you thankful that the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. There's a lot of times we look at the world and we see what's going on, and I do too, and we're just like, I cannot believe what's going on. I can't believe what the big dogs are doing in government right now. It feels like they are just selling us out. You know, you feel like you can't trust any of them, and you're like, what in the world? They're doing that to us. God says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Well, God, why don't you just take care of the evil in this world? Because if he did, he'd probably start with me and you. Because don't forget, we live in this flesh too. I don't know about you, but I sin every single day. You know, not on purpose, but hey, we live in this flesh. And the Bible says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be what? Spiritually minded is life and peace. But we struggle. We live in this flesh. I'm thankful that vengeance belongs to Him. I love what verse 3 says, The Lord is slow to anger. Let's not mistake that. For him being apathetic. God is being patient. God cares what's going on, but he's being patient. Why? Because the Bible says it's not his will that what? Any should perish. And I love that about our God. He is a patient God. I know that because he has been patient with me. I have turned my back on God so many times in my life. I, I, I said that, you know, I sin every day, but not on purpose. But there are times in my life where I did sin on purpose. I knew it was wrong, and I did it anyway. If that's not turning your back on God, I don't know what is. Sometimes I'm so mad that Jesus was put on the cross, but I forget it was my sins and your sins that put Jesus on the cross. I, I, I'm thankful he's slow to anger. 
It says, and he's great in power. And it talks about how great he is. And will not at all quit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. You're reading about natural disasters right here. When natural disasters come, there's nothing you can do. When the hurricanes comes, you can try to prepare, but if it's bad enough, it's going to take you down. You know, we, we read about how powerful God is. When God wants to chastise us, chasteneth us, then he's going to do it. You know, when God is going to say, I'm going to punish the wicked, there's absolutely nothing we can do to stop it. There's a world out there that thinks they can stop God, hide from God. In fact, in the future, uh, they're saying, May, let the rocks fall on us. And they're crying out to the rocks instead of crying out to God. And they're going to try to hide from God. No one can hide from God. And we need to make sure that we remember. In fact, brother, brother Dan Patrick preached a sermon. I remember as a young man, be sure your sin will find you out. And there's nothing more true than that statement. In verse 4, he rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and dryeth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth or withers and uh, caramel, caramel. I can uh, struggle with that word all the time. I want to say ca caramel. Y'all ever want to say that when y'all read that word? It's just me. Okay. And the flower of Lebanon languisheth or withers. The mountains quake at him. And the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide or endure in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Wow. That's kind of like gloom and doom a little bit, isn't it? You're like, Brother Justin, you're all you know, gloom and doom. But no, I'm going to tell you, I'm about boom and zoom because guess what? And I don't want to get ahead of myself. You and I have a day when the pain's going to be over. You and I are going to have a day where we don't have to shed any more tears. And if you're not looking forward to that every day, I feel sorry for you. I believe we should wake up every single day saying, is this the day that the Lord comes back? But I tell you what, right here in these first six verses... It's tough to read. It's some heavy stuff. It's talking about a judgment coming down on Nineveh. But I believe it also goes past that and goes past us, and I believe it's talking about a future judgment as well. There is a future judgment. We're like, Lord, I don't want them to get away with it. They're not going to get away with it, y'all. I, I get as frustrated as y'all do. I, I see what's going on around us. I get extremely frustrated. No one's getting away with anything. There's going to be a day of judgment. But aren't you thankful the Bible says we're not appointed unto the wrath that's going to be coming in the tribulation and great tribulation? I'm thankful that we get the boom and zoom before any of that happens. Before we get into Nahum, you really got to go back a couple books. The book of Jonah. Now we've all colored the pictures. You know, Jonah, he was going, God called him to go to Nineveh. And said, go them and preach the word because I'm going to destroy them if you don't. And Jonah ran, went to Tarshish, and caught the boat, uh, jumped out of the boat, great fish, barfed them up on the shore. And then he went to Nineveh kicking and screaming and said, okay, I'll do it. And had one of the greatest revivals the world has ever seen in the entire Nineveh <laughs> got saved. Just what Jonah did not want. He's like, bah humbug. It worked. They got saved. I'm afraid there's a lot of Christians that way, but I'm, I'm not going to get into that. But like, I cannot believe they got saved. Why, Lord? Why would you have to save them? And he had a pity party, and you can read about that in Jonah. Great revival. All of Nineveh saved. Let's fast forward 100 years. That's where we're at right now. It seems that that generation listened to Jonah, and they did what they were supposed to. But then the next generation... Man, they're right back to where they were. In fact, worse off than before. What is is that not sad? I look, I appreciate, I appreciate that I, you know I am saved. I'm on my way to heaven, but I have a burden on my heart. And it's for look, I'm, I have a burden for my youth group. I have a burden, you know, for the world in general. But my greatest burden is for my wife and for my children. Now, my wife is saved, praise the Lord. And my kids, uh, they, they claim salvation through Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful for that. And I, I praise the Lord for that. But my burden is for them first and foremost. 
It's great that we can be saved, but parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, man, there are some young people in your lives that we need to get down on our knees and beg God to help them, to be with them, because they are facing things that you and I never faced before. And we face some pretty crazy things. You know, uh, yours is probably different than mine's, but you're, you're talking about temptation like never before. Those little sinful devices called cell phones, and don't worry, I got one, you know, I, I, I call people too. But man, the power that, are, that is put in the young people's hands where all they have to do is hit one little button and they got the sin of the whole world and the temptation of the devil right in front of them, you better be careful. Look, look, we better get our young people, we better get our relatives, <coughs> those you care about, we need to get around them and pray for them. And I know you are a church that comes around your young people. I know that because I know your pastor, I know your youth pastor, so I know you love your young people, but they need us. They need prayer like never before. It's so sad that they were right back to where they were, but, but we come to verse 7. It's so crazy, verses 1 through 6, and it's doom and gloom, and God's like, I'm going to destroy you. It's going to happen in chapter 2. He describes how it's going to happen. In chapter 3, he talks about why it happened, and it's crazy. In fact, you read about how they would destroy. There are actually uh, books that are not from the Bible that back up what the Bible said, how they were destroyed when it comes to flooding and when it comes to fire and how they were conquered. It's a wonderful thing. You can do a study on that. But they were going to be conquered, doom and gloom. But then we come to verse 7. It says, the Lord is good. Well, wait a second. I thought he said he was going to destroy them. But it says the Lord is good. We're going to ask ourselves three questions tonight. And I'm going to let you go. Okay? I can't end too early because you're voting me in as pastor. I can't end too late. You might tell Bradley. And then I'll be in. You know. So I, I, we're going to get it right in between. First of all, I want you to ask the question, is God good? And I know I'll get an amen from everybody, but I also want to ask ourselves, what do we know of good? What do we know of good? As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Isaiah 5, 20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, and put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And when you read Romans chapter 1, we are there. Yeah. So something can look good and be bad, and also something can look bad and be good. So God's going to be judging Nineveh and destroying them. But then in verse 7, he say, it says, The Lord, the Lord is good. You know, the, the world loves the point to the brutality of scriptures. Um, a lady, a mom actually came to me one time. She goes, look, I want you to go see my son. Um, I don't know if he's saved. She raised him. Good, good godly home. I mean, it was good godly home. I want you to go see this young man and, and just talk to him. So I went to visit him and his girlfriend. They were living together and stuff. And, and man, he was so intelligent. If you haven't gathered it yet, I'm not that intelligent. I'll go ahead and tell you that right now. I see some of y'all smiling and it hurts my feelings, but we're going to move ahead. So I remember going down, just sitting, small talk and stuff. And then finally I was like, so your mom tells, tells me y'all not talking right now. What's up? And then we got into some of the most uh, intense and not, not shouting, not arguing, but intense debate that I've ever been in in my life. Five hours later, I get up. I, I said, can I pray for y'all? He goes, I don't know. What do you think? She goes, I don't care. So I pray for him. I go to my car, and I just collapse in this seat. I'm sweating. It was that intense. It was crazy. One thing that he brought up was, and they love to bring it up, is brutality of Scripture. You know, God told the Israelites to killed the Canaanites, to drive them out. They're like, what kind of God is that? And you can need to ask yourself, what, how am I going to answer some of these questions? That's why I'm really big into apologetics, and that's not apologizing for the Bible. That's just knowing why you believe what you believe. See, this young man knew what to believe. He had been raised that way, but he never knew why to believe it. And so they throw out this thing like the brutality of scriptures, this person's been killed, this person they're driving out, even women and children and stuff. 
But what you got to look at is that we have a patient God. We already talked about that. What they don't look at is the Canaanites had 400 years to repent. In that 400 years, they're sacrificing babies. They're putting on the altar, what is it, Moloch? The heated arms where they heat up the statue and lay the babies on there and they burn to death. They're beating the drums to drown out the sounds of the, the children screaming. I mean, how evil was that? You're like, that's terrible. How many babies have we killed in the United States? How many? Look, that, look, we don't have time to get on that too long, but I tell you what, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. I love kids. My parents were foster parents. Uh, they adopted um, four kids. Um, I... I I love kids, but it's amazing all the different idols that the world worships now to sacrifice their kids. It's a worship. It is. It's just like worshiping back in the days. But guess what? If you have done that, there is grace at the foot of the cross. I'm not condemning you. I'm saying there is still salvation for you. Just come to the foot of the cross. I wonder how long the United States has, y'all. There was a countdown for the Canaanites. There was a countdown. There was a stopwatch where God said, Enough's enough, Sodom and Gomorrah. Enough's enough, Nineveh. When is it going to be enough for the United States? And I, look, I, I love my country. It's still the greatest country in the world. Somebody said it's a sinking ship, but it's the only boat worth being on right now. I can tell you that right now. But, man, we need to pray for our country because how long? The only thing that gives me you know, a, a, a little hope in Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, God God was looking for, what, ten righteous men, and there are still righteous men and women in this country who love the Lord, and that gives me hope that we can still have a revival, y'all. We can have it. If you want it bad enough, you can have it right here in this church. What is it the pastors say? You draw that circle around, you step into the circle and say, God, start with me. May I have revival. Each one of you do that, you will have revival in this church. I promise you. I promise you. Oh, that's patient God. There was a missionary to South Africa, Alan Gardner. Uh, he failed a lot. <laughs> He was a hard-headed missionary when you study about him, and he wanted to make sure he got into places that no one had ever been before. He said, while God gives me strength, failure will not daunt me. So this missionary, he's out, he's promoting he's, he, the gospel, he's telling people, trying to get him saved, and uh, with every bit of might he's got, they found him in a hut somewhere, and he was dead. Not far from him, he had his diary. And they were reading his diary and he's talking about starvation and how he was all alone. He was isolated and the pain and the suffering he was going through. But then the last little scribble marks they could barely make out said, I am overwhelmed with the sense of the goodness of God. Y'all, when I read that, it just melts my heart. Look, I want to be that way, y'all. If, if I'm dying, if I'm sitting there on my deathbed, I want to say that I am overwhelmed in the sense of the goodness of God. And sometimes it's easy to look around us and see the devastation, the destruction, the way that they're using us in government, the way that the political system, the way that they're shoving, and I don't want to say too much. I don't know if we're on YouTube or not. I know if we say too much on YouTube at our church, they'll ban us, you know. But I'm telling you, they're trying to put and shove so much down our throats, but man, God's still good. God's still good. Can I give you a couple of verses? I just want to read these quickly to you. Exodus 34, 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Uh, 1 Chronicles 16, 34. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Psalm 107, 8. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Just try it. But I tell you what, there's a reason sometimes we don't try it. There's a, there, sometimes there's a reason why even we as Christians stop relying on the goodness and thinking about the goodness of of the Lord. You know, when it comes to eating, I have a passion for food. I like to eat. Give me an amen. Come on now. All right now. Um, 
If I were, in fact, I did. I, we had a gift card, my wife and I. We don't get to go out often, but we've been sending my kids to every VBS in the nation uh, so we could have the summer. Uh, oh, we, we don't even know what that church is. You're going to that VBS, you know. And we, had, we have a stack of gift cards we've been saving, and I'm like, honey, where are we going to go? Where are we going to go? Try not to be too giddy, you know, because we had not dropped the kids yet. And, you know, we had, uh, uh, oh, man, what is Outback? Oh, Outback. We never get to go to Outback. It's too expensive. I'm in the ministry, y'all. How you know, Outback cost money? But we had a gift card. Went to the Outback. And y'all, I've never gotten this before from the Outback, but I got the prime rib, y'all. And I, because I love my wife so much, I'm like, let's split this. I'll get some shrimp. You can have the shrimp. I'll have the prime rib because I'm such a sweet husband. Uh, she probably wants some of that prime. I did share the prime rib with her too, okay? So y'all, they seared it on both sides and they just did all this stuff to it. I don't even know what it, I started eating it and it was like eating baby angels, y'all. It was so good and they had the bread. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but there was bread and it was all good. And then they had the baked potato loaded and everything. All right. What if you're bringing me a prime rib, right? What if you cook me a prime rib? All right. Would you do that for me? I believe you. Okay. All right. So you're going to bring me a prime rib, but right before you get here, I take out a bag of Doritos, and I just start chomping away at the bag of Doritos. And I got, like, one of those cheeseburgers from McDonald's that's, I don't know what it is, but it's, like, called a burger, and, you know, it used to be cheap, and it was, like, a restaurant burger price. And, and uh, you know, I'm eating that, and you walk in with that prime rib, and I've already ate a whole bag, of, no, two bags of Doritos, because they're only full this, this deep, right? So I ate two bags of Doritos, and I ate the cheeseburger, two cheeseburgers and fries. If you bring me that prime rib, am I going to want the prime rib? No. Which one is better, Doritos or prime rib? All right, don't any of y'all say, Doritos. No, don't give me that. No, prime rib is better, all right? There's a reason why people don't taste and see that the Lord is good is because they are filling up with the junk of this world that He is bringing the greatest satisfaction they could ever feel in their lives, yet they can't even taste and see because they're full of the junk of the world. Man, it feels like a losing battle sometimes, but I know we're going to win in the end. But man, the things that are on TV, the things that we listen to, the things that we're watching, and the, uh, wherever it may be, uh, the filth that we... Oh, man, the internet, good gracious... No wonder nobody wants to taste and see that the Lord is good because they're filling up on junk. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, but you've got to be hungry. You've got to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And it said you will be filled. That's God's word. He said that. And I'm thankful. So is God good? He, he's good. The question is, do we know what good is? I didn't know if I was going to go here tonight, but I'm going to go here. I think we're okay. I don't. Have, we're not okay. Okay, we're going to move on. Um, my dad. I uh, love my dad. He is a craftsman. Anybody else build in here? Anybody like to work with cra- You know, wood and stuff. Yeah. So and and you know, if I'd hung out with my dad growing up, I would know how to do something. I worked harder trying to get out of work when I was younger than it would have been just to do the work, you know. He knew how to do everything. I don't know how to do anything. I changed the tire once, but, um, you know, I think, I, well, maybe I forgot to put it back on. It doesn't matter. Anyway, he loves to build stuff. We have a pond behind our house, a three-acre pond. Why would his been there, you know, with the young people and stuff? And my dad was building things. He built a gaga pit, a nine square, if some of y'all know what that is. He also said, I want to build a zip line. Okay, sounds like a lawsuit, but let's go ahead, you know, and I build it. He, he, 25 feet in the air, it goes across the pond. And every question we get from a teenager says, can we drop into the water? I'm like, no, you can't. Tr-. There's like from here to that wall of grass before you get to the pond. I'm like, no, there's a harness. We strap you in, and I strap them in tight, uh, parents, if they ever come back. You know, I, we take good care of them. Just make sure you sign that waiver. All right, so he built that, and, you know, he started having these pains in his side, and, man, it started hurting him, and, but he kept on working and stuff, and he, he finished building the zip line, and he got where he's like, he was so sick. He went to the doctor and found out he had cancer. And not just had cancer, he was eat up with it. I mean, all over. They couldn't believe how much cancer he had. He was bedridden, couldn't get up, and... 
Well, right before he got fully bedridden, he was like, I've got to finish it. Like, what are you talking about, got to finish? You finished it, Dad. You finished that zip line, and we're proud of you. He got out there with the little bit of strength he had left. He went up there, and he had some boards, and he had some lights, and he did something with some wires. If you come to our house today, there's a cross that lights up every single night at the top of that zip line. That was the last thing my daddy ever built. My daddy passed away uh, January before last. And y'all, it was hard. It hurt. It still hurts. Raise your hand if you ever lost somebody. Yeah, it hurts, does it not? You can't, you can't have somebody describe it to you. It's just a broken heart. I was there when my granddaddy was pa passed away. I was there when my grandma took her last breath, very close to her. And then I was there in the room with dad, sitting night after night. You know how it is when you have to take care of somebody. You know, you take turns as a family. Well, I was there when he took that last breath. And I went over there. My mom went over there and started calling, Gary, Gary. And I was sitting there. I was like, oh, no. And then when you've ever been there, you see the color leave. And it's just, I was sitting there in shock. My dad, he's gone. My mama cried a little bit, but then she started praying. She started worshiping the Lord. And all of a sudden, it's just like, oh, wait a second. Oh, that's right. My daddy, he's healed. Oh, my good God. God has healed my dad. He's in heaven with Christ. And I was reminded that God is good. Even in the tough times, even in the destruction, even in the pain, God is good. Look, I, look, that's only the first point, but I'll tell you here right now, I just want to ask you, have you been through something painful in your life? I want to tell you God's still good. If you don't hear anything tonight, if I wasn't here for any other reason, it's to tell you that God is still good. And I wish we had time to go through the other two points. Maybe Jonathan had me back. I don't know. We'll hit the other two. But tonight, we're just going to end right here. Because I feel like maybe somebody needed some encouragement tonight. Because I know I've needed encouragement in my life when I felt pain, when I felt anguish, when I felt like there was no hope whatsoever. There was a lot of prayer requests on that sheet. And praise the Lord for y'all taking the time to pray for these people. There's a lot of hurt. A lot of people that need you. A lot of people in here. I'll go ahead and tell you, we need each other, y'all. We need. That's why you're here on a Wednesday night. We need each other and we need the Lord. No matter what's going on in your life, can I just tell you, God is good. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? Let's make this a personal and private time of prayer. We're going to get Brother Caleb to come up here. Maybe we just need to come up to the altar and just say, God, thank you for being good. I, Lord, you know what's going on in my life. He's seeing the hurt that nobody else sees. Maybe you just need to come and say, thank you, God, for being good.